Hi, folks. I'm Rich Lucy. I am a Senior Prevention Program Manager here in the Drug Enforcement Administration's Community Outreach and Prevention Support section, and welcome to this episode of Prevention Profiles Take 5. Excited about today's guest. You will uh, know him from a previous role that he had, um, but he's in a brand new role, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that right now. And so I'm going to introduce you to Rick Burt. Now, Rick serves as director of the Washington, D.C. Highway Safety Office. In this role, he leads the office team in implementing evidence-informed countermeasures that ensure the safety of all roadway users. Rick has over a decade of highway safety and prevention experience. Prior to joining D.C. government, Rick served as president and CEO of Students Against Destructive Decisions, a national youth prevention and activism organization focused on mobility safety, substance use, personal health and safety, and leadership development. During his time at SAD, Rick authored several publications for teen drivers and adult allies on matters of mobility safety and was often called upon by the media to speak on these matters. He has also consulted for highway safety offices and nonprofit organizations in a variety of capabilities. And with that, Rick, welcome to the podcast. Rich, always great to be with you, sir. Thanks so much for having me. Excited for our conversation today. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, I mean, I know you all from your work uh, previously at SAD um, and excited now in your new role uh, as director of DC's Highway Office Safety. As you know, uh, as we've talked, you know, it's with the Highway Safety Office, I'm a resident of the district. So it's kind of nice to know you in a, you know, professional capacity and also from a personal uh, capacity. So um, yeah. let's just get into it and, and talk about actually, you know, your previous hat and how that's informed your, your current hat. So as I mentioned in your bio, you led SAD for a little over nine years and now you are leading DC's Highway Safety Office. So in just the short amount of time you've been in DC government and what's it been two months, if that? Yeah, yeah. About it. yeah, um, yeah. So what have you learned going from focusing on highway safety at a national level down to a territory level? And of course you noticed I called us a territory, <laughs> uh, those of us who live in DC. Yeah, that's right. Well, again, thanks for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure to work with you and really appreciate the work of, of the DEA on so many levels. Uh, D.C. is really a, a unique place to be. It's a place where many people call home, like you and me, Rich. It's a place where people come for education. It's a place where people come to play, to conduct business. And so people often forget that we are not only a, a city, but we're also functioning as a county, as many of our listeners will know, and then we're also functioning as a state. So mm -hmm. within one small jurisdiction of about 76 square miles, we have all three levels of government kind of working in one warehouse, one, one, bill, one billing, if you will. So that creates mm -hmm. some unique challenges and some unique opportunities, some opportunities for collaboration, which we'll talk a little bit about here today, but you know, also some opportunities to leverage those national experiences that I've had, you know, uh, to, to bring together and bring to the forefront of folks' mind uh, some of the best practices and the sharing of those best practices that I've been able to see uh, working coast to coast to be able to bring some of the cultural nuances that are unique to DC and certainly some of the unique challenges that we face kind of operating in that sphere of being kind of all three, but also having the seat of our of our national government literally in our backyard. So, uh, you know, there's opportunities, I think, to to share and to to learn in both DC as a as a laboratory of places to try new things, but to also bring to bring to the forefront of folks' mind those things that are working across the country as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, we didn't talk about this in, in prep or not, but I know you know DC is it's probably not unique, but the sense that it's a very commuter heavy area. So obviously our, our public transportation but also our roadways. So that's going to create its own set of challenges. Um, and our, as you just said, our close connection to Maryland and to Virginia, um, mm -hmm. which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about, you know, collaboration with, yeah. with those states as well. Yeah, it's um, true. It's true. Yeah, we, we have about, you know, pre-pandemic, we had close to 2 million people a day that commuted into the district. Now the district's population is about 800,000. So you can do the math there to see that, you know, our city would almost triple in capacity, almost taking a breath in as folks mm -hmm. would come in every day and then taking a breath out as folks commute at home. So obviously we rely heavily on public transportation, on our roadways, 
um, on, on what we call a multimodal approach to safety to really help keep people moving. Uh, in recent years, we've seen an, an uptick in our pedestrian and our bicycle related crashes. Mm -hmm. So we've had to really focus in on how to use effective countermeasures to raise awareness, not only for our pedestrians and our bicyclists, but also for our roadway users, many of whom are driving here from out of state, uh, not just Maryland and Virginia, but from places all across the country and oftentimes all across the globe as well. So we really do have a unique group of stakeholders that we're trying to engage and educate, educate and empower to really help create this culture of safety that uh, no matter what time of day you're coming in or what time of day you're traveling, that you've got access to a safe and equitable form of transportation. Well, I know from the time that I've lived here, which is, you know, since 1999 now, I mean, I view D.C. as, you know, kind of almost cut it up into thirds. It's a it's a residential area. It's a heavily business area. But it's also one of the main sources of our revenue is we are a tourist, a big time tourist destination. So, you know, you've got all that coming together at once. Yeah, we, we call it the live, work, and play model, right? Folks who live here and they call this home, and we're very proud of our Washingtonians and really unique things that folks don't oftentimes realize are, are home to D.C., like go-go music, Frederick Douglass, all sorts of great things that really make D.C. a unique place to live. Obviously, a place to work, like we just talked about, not only government, city, uh, city and federal uh, folks that call this a place to work, but also more nonprofits per square foot than any other place in the country. Uh, lots of places for innovation, universities, uh, almost every uh, Fortune 500 company has some sort of presence here because of the seat of the federal government. So there really is, uh, you know, pun intended, a lot of intersections uh, that we rely on here to, to bring people in and to keep them safe as they, as they conduct their business, not to mention all the fun. You know, we're the sports capital of the world, home of the, the World Series winning uh, Washington Nationals, uh, mm -hmm. the Stanley Cup winning uh, Caps, the Wizards who are still working on some things, uh, and, and you know, uh, our professional soccer team as well. So lots right. of ways to live, work, and play in the district. Yeah. Um, so going back to kind of the transition period between your time at SAD and now here in, in D.C., yeah. is there a specific approach from your national experience that you hope to bring to D.C.? Yeah, there's uh, Secretary Buttigieg has been really innovative in leading something called the National Roadway Strategy. Across the country, we've been seeing an increase in roadway deaths um, from multiple modes, whether that's drivers, whether that's pedestrians, whether that's bicyclists, an increase in the number of, of deaths that we're seeing on our roadways, uh, particularly in a post-pandemic world. So at a national level, SAD was a, was a supporter of the National Roadway Strategy and particularly something called the Safe System Approach. And at the highest level, what the Safe System Approach says is that we know that folks uh, are going to be, people are going to make up our, our infrastructure. Yes, we have things that we should be doing in terms of the actual construction of our infrastructure, but we live in a very people-centered uh, world where when we move from point A to point B, there's a lot of room for human error. And so even when humans make an error, we should design systems that can step in and uh, compensate for the errors that they will make. Uh, I call it the sandwich approach, right? If you think of your sandwich, there's lots of layers in there that keep your, uh, you know, your sandwich uh, together and kind of keep it functioning. And so having the sandwich approach is something that we talked about on a national level, but really putting that into practice here in a, in a state See what I did there? I called it a state just to speak it into fruition. Uh, a state like D.C. is really important so that we can have safe, so that we have safe roadways. But we can also have safe people. That's the portion of, of the puzzle that my office is specifically responsible for, looking at how we can, uh, you know, increase our enforcement using a lens of equity to make sure that we're being fair for all of our roadway, roadway users, but to also make sure we're increasing education so that folks understand the safest way to move about the city, how they can get from point A to point B in the most uh, most fair and, and safe way. That's something we're really hoping that we can ramp up here in D.C., particularly increasing the number of educational programs that we have, the partnerships that I've been fortunate enough to, to garner and to build across the country. I hope we can bring a lot of that here to our, our hometown highway safety office and leverage those relationships and those resources to help make D.C. an even safer city. Mm -hmm. So let's switch now to uh, connect this to our, you know, our primary audience uh, for colleges and universities. So I know from your time at SAD and now in D.C., you have worked to raise awareness about impaired driving among college students. Tell our viewers why and specifically what they should be concerned about. 
Yeah, that one of the toughest years of a young person's life is that year between graduating high school and figuring out what's next, whether that's going to a four-year institution, a trade school, uh, a commuter school, or uh, going to join our armed forces, or, or maybe going into industry. It's a period of huge change, and I don't know about you, Rich, but I don't know many people that like change. Uh, and so change brings new opportunity, also brings new challenges. And so particularly for our young people that are going into residential universities, that support network, those social norms that they knew from high school, having mom, dad, carrying adult or adult ally kind of in their corner, that broader support network of coaches, clergy, and other community leaders that they knew and leaned on, all of that is gone almost overnight. And they find themselves oftentimes in a new environment with new people who have different cultural expectations and different expectations around alcohol and drug consumption. So one of the things that uh, SAD has really tried to do is help bridge that gap between uh, your senior year and whatever comes next and finding ways to help parents and adult allies really prepare their young person for what comes next through meaningful conversations and resources but to also help them understand uh, the consequences that come with making some of those choices, whether that be from a health perspective, a legal perspective, or what have you. When we think specifically about impaired driving, uh, you know, there are a number of unique challenges, particularly for our universities that uh, you know, might be in a more rural area. There are limitations on public transportation or ride share. There are limitations maybe on cultural expectations where some universities are in dry counties uh, or in areas that don't have access. Uh, to maybe more more abundant resources because that culturally isn't acceptable. So here in DC, we are a, a hub of, of institutional knowledge, uh, pun intended. Again, we have a lot of institutions, 18 universities that are operating within our jurisdiction. And so we have all of those same challenges that I just alluded, uh, minus the, the, the opportunity piece. And that's something we really try to drive home to folks and that we have a multitude of ways that folks can get from point A to point B, whether that be through our metro system, our bus system, uh, ride shares, uh, being, you know, be obviously being a, a sober uh, pedestrian and bicyclist is important. So what we're trying to do is r really threefold. Number one, educate our young people as they come back to campus uh, each year to make sure they know of those resources that exist on campus and in the community to help them make more informed choices and, and to also help them understand how to be an engaged bystander. If their friend, if someone they're with, a person they see on the street, seems to be in danger of making an impaired related mobility choice, there's ways that you can intervene and help make sure that they get home safely. But to also do the same thing for parents. Uh, again, DC is unique. We have uh, you know, great laws in place that are meant to protect folks, but folks who are particularly from other countries, folks who are from uh, other parts of the world come to DC not understanding all of our laws, particularly around right. access to alcohol, cannabis, and other substances. So it's all about education, it's about enforcement, it's about equity and making sure that folks understand as they come to campus, they understand those unique pieces. So I, I, I've talked about this before on, on other episodes um, about the relationship between alcohol and drug use and traumatic events, stressful times. You know, we tend to see those things go up and sure. the pandemic, certainly, you know, 2020 and on. Yeah. Um, is that something that we also saw then? Did we see any kind of a connection, not only in the use and misuse of those substances, but a connection to impaired driving as well? We did. Yeah. Unfortunately, we saw an uptick. You know, Pre-pandemic, uh, we were looking at nationally about 20 to 22 percent uh, of our fatalities across the country were related to impaired driving. We saw that number escalate to over 30 percent in some cases. Um, a couple of things go along with that, not only the deterioration of mental health, I think, with so much of our country, but also, you know, we, we have this uh, conversation, this debate going nationally around legalization of cannabis and what's happening with cannabis. Uh, and so, you know, there's, that's a very nuanced discussion that folks don't oftentimes understand as they get behind the wheel. Uh, we also saw more and more folks uh, abusing, and I'm preaching to the choir on this as well, but, you know, abusing other substances. Like here in D.C., mm -hmm. we saw a huge increase in PCP uh, and prescription drugs and in other substances that were impairing. And then also, let's not forget about the poly substance issue, uh, where folks are using alcohol and a drug, maybe two drugs at once. Um, forgetting that you know prescription drugs or over-the-counter medication can also be misused. And so understanding all of those nuances has, has contributed to this new reality. Now, the good news is some of those numbers are going down, but here in D.C., we're really trying to raise the alarm because for a variety of reasons, we can, are continuing to see that uptick in roadway mm -hmm. fatalities, particularly among our pedestrians, our bicyclists, and our other users of micro-mobility. So think scooters, e-bikes, things like that. And oftentimes it's tied to uh, and I don't want to jump in the conversation, but tied to 
you know, colleg collegiate students who are coming to campus using one of those modes, they're being impaired, and they find themselves either seriously injured or tragically hurt, as well as, you know, DC has uh, a plethora of young professionals, particularly young professionals who are entering the workforce and now again talking about another time of transition, they're finding themselves in this period where now they're young professionals but operating in new social norms, and so they're also struggling with uh, substance use in a new way as well. So lots of things to, to navigate and unpack there that, again, make DC really unique. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned like the influx of young adults that, that come into the area, even if it's temporarily. We know over the summertime, we get a lot of college students who are coming in and internship mm -hmm. opportunities, not only with right. federal agencies, but also, you know, K Street and, you know, the businesses that are in the district, but also the domed building that, you know, <laughs> right there on Capitol Hill, there's an awful lot of interns, yeah. you know, that are working up there. So yeah. each summer for about 10 to 12 weeks, we have, you know, that mm -hmm. influx of young adult college students that are from all around the country that, you know, all of a sudden are migrating into the district. Yeah, it's, it's true. And each one of those individuals, just like each person of any age that comes to the district for a short period or longer period of time, they bring different cultural expectations uh, of what's acceptable. You know, some parts of the world regularly consume different substances and have different expectations around substance use. The same thing around alcohol. They bring those cultural nuances and, and oftentimes a lack of an understanding of what that means to use that substance, particularly in conjunction with the environment they're now finding themselves in. They don't have that same support network. They don't have those same elements in place to help keep them safe. Uh, and so it really does create a dangerous environment that we want to try to help, help them understand the dangers, mitigate those risks, and then make sure they're obviously staying safe as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to move on to my third question here and, and talk a little bit about your office and, and what you have coming, you know, all right, here comes the pun, what's coming down the pike um, or what's already in play um, that are specifically relevant to our audience. So what are some of the initiatives that your audience, that your office is rolling out in D.C. that are relevant to colleges and universities? Yeah, so several things that we're going to be doing in the year ahead that we're really excited about that will engage our, our college communities, again, in our very short um, or I should say smaller jurisdiction of about 76 square miles, we've got 18 universities that are operating. Some of those are virtual, some of those are in person. Many of our residential campuses are, are places that folks know. They're also really unique because many of them are, are what I call baked into our communities. So many of our campuses are, you know, there isn't a, a hard line between where the campus starts and where the community ends. They're really integrated in, which is great for so many reasons, but you know, sometimes those barriers mix and mingle, and so it creates some unique challenges. So one of the things that we're going to be doing is some intense training with our officers that are, make up our university police departments to help them better understand the risks and pressures that young people face, particularly as it relates to impaired driving. Help them understand uh, how to do more testing for young people to, you know, to, to understand their sobriety, senior field sobriety tests are something we're going to be doing training on with our law enforcement officers that are specifically on college campuses so they can help, again, understand an impairment of a young person and then, again, help make sure they find a safe way home. We're also going to be beefing up our educational opportunities on our campuses, so providing funding and support, technical assistance to many of the residential universities that, again, make up the very bedrock of our community. So finding ways to engage their schools of public health in that conversation, engage their uh, student wellness centers, their, uh, you know, their, their offices of student affairs and other stakeholders that are on that campus to really be a part of the solution. We've also really ramped up our ability to leverage the incredible capacity that some of our universities have to solve the problems on, in our city, to really make sure that our students are a part of our conversations. And so we're gonna be working with several of our institutions to, to really ingrain them into problem solving, whether that be you know, seatbelt usage and how to increase seatbelt usage or things like impairment. How do we get, uh, you know, how we use best practices to uh, resolve some of those impairment issues. So those are, those are a few of the things on, on the education and enforcement side. And then in a broader strategy, we're gonna be working with our partners at the Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Treatment and Recovery to really think about a broader strategy. How can we engage these campuses in some uniform programming and some uniform culture building to address not only the, the consumption issue, but then also the transportation issue. So we're really excited to be working with the center to think about what that coalition of universities could look like, to think about those uniform practices that we can implement, and then most importantly, how do we engage our community members in the education that happens, happens on campus? So how can we, if we've already got these barriers that have been literally torn down, how do we connect those dots? 
so that our community resources are, are readily available to our students and vice versa, that our community really sees our students as a, as a solution to many of the problems that our cities and our, our I should say, our state faces. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love the, the, the phrase you used about the campus being baked into the community. You know, for as long as I've been working in this field, you know, we often talk about the college town, uh, you know, which is, you know, the university or the college that yeah. is a major driver of a city or, you know, and it's a lot of times, it doesn't always have to be rural, but a lot of times it seems to be. But when I think yeah. about what you just said, and I've always envisioned or I've always viewed D.C. Um, as really a patchwork of neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, when I think of some of the colleges, they're exactly what you've said. I mean, you think of Georgetown is yeah. the neighborhood. I think of American University, uh, Tenleytown, where I live yeah. in, the, in Northeast D.C., you know, Catholic University is a huge part of Brookland. I yeah. mean, so um, Howard University yeah. is that is the neighborhood. Um, so as we talk about the schools that are here and, and I know we've talked about this and I always found this um, this conversation very interesting. But again, both from a professional and a personal perspective, what are some of the unique aspects of where the colleges and universities are located in D.C.? that are related to highway safety, including impaired driving? Yeah, so one of the things that all those campuses that you just mentioned, you're, you're absolutely right. They are the heartbeat, almost the soul of many of those communities. But what's interesting from a design perspective is that as the city was built out, many of our, what we call our arterial roads, this, the, the main thoroughfares that get you from point A to point B, were built along the perimeter, or even in some cases through some of those campuses. And so it creates some really unique challenges, but also some really unique opportunities. Uh, number one, most of those universities are right along what we call our high injury network. So these mm -hmm. are uh, a system of roadways that represent about 5% of our roadways, but account for nearly 50% of our fatalities. So what we're trying to do is, is really look at from an enforcement, education, and design perspective, what is it about these roadways, not only because of the volume of traffic, but because of their situation uh, where they're placed, and also because of the culture, what is built around them, that makes them so dangerous. So we think that universities can be a part of that solution. So many of the, the campuses that you just alluded to are going to be engaged in what we're now going to be calling our Safe Communities Program, a gathering of community partners that will allow us to use data, that will allow us to use enforcement strategies and education to say, hey, what can we do, particularly in these high injury networks, to curb, uh, to, to, to curb uh, traffic fatalities that are happening on our streets. And again, when you drill down into the fatalities, uh, some reports have found that nearly 33%, which is pretty true nationally, of our fatalities are tied to some form of impairment. Uh, I think that number is probably underreported, especially with when you consider drug driving and the unique challenges there. Um, we are so thankful to our partners at MPD uh, and the great work that they're doing, but obviously they have limited capacity and limited resources to be able to address many of those incidents, particularly if there's uh, you know a person who is uh, appears appears to be impaired, but maybe doesn't have a you know a, a blood alcohol content uh, for alcohol of over 0.08. That's where those programs like drug recognition experts, the DREs, mm -hmm. come in that are so important. And we're working with MPD and our the host of 60 plus agencies that are law enforcement agencies that work within the district. Another thing that makes us unique. Uh, to be able to beef up training for our law enforcement people to respond to those corridors, to enforce those corridors, and then to spot those drug impaired driving issues. So to, to actually answer your question around impairment, I think we have, again, the unique challenge of so many people are coming into the city for their nightlife, their entertainment, their social aspects, that even if they choose to you know, use, a, use the metro, use public transportation, a public transportation is going to end. So at some point they're gonna exit that transportation and they might then choose to get into a vehicle. Uh, and so we're trying to work with our partners in Maryland and Virginia uh, and within what's called WMATA, the Washington Metro Area Transit Authority who runs the Metro to see how we can address that issue as well. So it's, it's great that we're getting impaired drivers safely out of DC using other means, but we don't want them to become then impaired drivers when they get to you know, the end of the line in Springfield in uh, the end of the red line, the end of the blue line in Largo or wherever they might be going. We want to make sure that when they get where they're going, they still have a safe route to get that last stretch home, which we know sometimes can be the most deadly. Mm -hmm. So I, we were on a call recently in the last month or so, and I was you know, very intrigued about um, an example used about Georgetown um, University. Mm -hmm. and I think it had to do with their speed limit restrictions and how that was yeah. being looked at as maybe a model elsewhere. 
Uh, and of course, Georgetown has its own unique in sense in that it's not directly accessible by Metro. Um, but can you tell, talk a little bit about that you know, aspect of, of, of Georgetown? Yeah, so Georgetown, for those who, who don't know, uh, is located in what we'd call our Northwest Corridor of our, of our community. And Georgetown is unique in that really when you look at the, the makeup of the grid, it's a series of four-way stops. Uh, and one of the things that makes Georgetown uh, so safe is that number one, uh, you do have those frequent stops. And so folks get conditioned to drive a little ways and they stop, drive a little ways and they stop. That's not usually the case throughout the city. That's not usually the case throughout the country. Uh, mm -hmm. Our drivers are, are navigating a system that oftentimes isn't built for driver conditioning. It's built for ease. It's built for uh, you know financial feasibility as well. What's the cheapest way to design a road? But in mm -hmm. Georgetown, you have this consistent way of navigating that stop, go, stop, go. What's also interesting is that DC took the very proactive step to lower our speed limits throughout the district uh, to 20 miles per hour in our residential areas. Uh, we say that 20 is plenty is our is our campaign, working with our mm -hmm. Vision Zero office on that effort. And what we found is that if you are a pedestrian or a micro mobility user and you're hit uh, at 20 miles per hour, your, your chances of survival are, are pretty good. When you raise that to 30 or 35, which is the speed limit for many other jurisdictions across the country, you almost cut your chance of survivability in half because you're you're wrestling, you know, a 2,000 pound plus beast that's going to win each and every time when you're a bicyclist or a pedestrian or a scooter user, what have you. So the the design of that community really does lend itself to be a safer neighborhood from that aspect. It's also, you know, safer because citywide we've implemented that strategy of reducing the speed limit, but in particular, it's been very successful in Georgetown. Still some challenges to work out, particularly around, you know, like K Street and M Street, some of those main, more main thoroughfares that go through the city, but in the residential mm -hmm. areas where many of our, our, our neighbors and our friends are moving throughout the course of the day, they feel, they experience a little bit higher degree of safety because of that design. So Rick, I think we've made a pretty good case as to why colleges and universities should be, you know, paying attention to this issue of impaired driving. And so as they focus on preventing impaired driving among their students, what do you say are like the one or two things that should be top of mind for them as they're starting to plan their programs around this? Yeah, so Rich, I'm going to push you. I'm going to, I'm going to ask for the top three because there are three okay. things that, <laughs> that, that come to mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's policy. I think it's practices. And I think it's people. And so let's first start with policies. There are lots of policies that universities can put into place that really do protect their young people. You know, obviously things like bystander intervention programs, uh, trainings that staff can go through. Um, the Higher Education Center has a long list of those that I encourage our listeners and our university partners to, to reach out to and just do a quick assessment over whether or not your university has some of those programs. Also give a push towards, uh, towards SAD. They have a great program called You Are the Key, uh, which is designed for universities and high schools alike to be able to do an assessment of what your, your policies and practices are to make sure that uh, you've got what you need from a policy perspective to make sure that uh, your young people are staying safe. So that's the first thing. In terms mm -hmm. of practices, I think it's, it's again, going back to training. Uh, you know, sometimes for our university partners who have been absolutely inundated with public health information over the past three years, oftentimes these issues of substance use and impaired driving, they fall to the wayside, right? So, or if they're mentioned, they're mentioned at a freshman orientation and then, you know, that's it. Uh, we know that substance use leads to so many other behaviors on campuses and it leads to so many other challenges in the classroom as well. So thinking about how to integrate this into other existing programs is really important. Uh, we were sad, I can't say we anymore, sad released a, a great call to action with NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, a few years yep. back that looked at some really great case studies of universities that uh, really have been successful in integrating this educational component. Um, one of them is in what was in Wyoming, uh, which was really seeing an increase in uh, impaired impairment related incidents in a very rural part of the country. Um, obviously, that's a little different than what I experience now in DC every day, but a great case study of looking at how you can increase, you know, increase um, classroom awareness, make uh, impaired driving part of the curriculum, engage um, students in policy and, and physics and other elements in the discussion around traffic safety, uh, to also things like, you know, just being mindful of when you plan games, uh, when they're athletic events, uh, what's your plan to make sure folks are getting home safely? What's your enforcement strategy like to make sure that your on-campus law enforcement is in coordination with your off-campus law enforcement? That's something we're really going to be focusing on as well. 
uh, as it relates to our university partners here in the district to make sure that our city PDs and our university PDs are really working hand in glove to make sure that those things are done. So that's a practice that maybe isn't necessarily a policy level, but it's a practice of how you kind of get that training out, that integration out. Uh, and then it's uh, you know also about the people, the third component, mm -hmm. which is really creating this culture of safety. Um, for so long, there, you know, there's been this taboo on substance use in our communities, and so it oftentimes happens in the shadows. Um, we want to try to, to educate folks to understand what are the risks and what are the risks that they're taking on when they use a substance, and how can they make sure they, you know, they're really being putting safety first and foremost when they when they make that choice. Uh, how can you make sure that you're training for bystander intervention so that p young people, particularly young people who may be getting to know each other in those first couple months of classes, mm -hmm. which we know are sometimes some of the most dangerous and some of the most deadly, uh, how can they really create instant support networks and, again, provide access to community resources, access to campus resources to make sure that everyone gets home safely? So policies, practices, people, I think those are the, the three things that you know, I would be looking at, and we're going to be certainly looking to engage our university partners on uh, in the academic year ahead. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, that SAD call to action um, because I didn't want to lose this opportunity to tell you. I mean, we've, for our viewers, that report is available on campusdrugprevention.gov. We had uh, first posted it there when we learned about it. But now in your role with the work that you're going to be doing with DC and the Highway Safety Office and colleges and universities around impaired driving, as your office develops resources for this population and such, you know, we'll be happy to include those on, on the website as well, because we want people to, to know about them. Absolutely. Yeah. And everything we, we make, it may, you know, may be available. It may say DC branded, but we're happy to share the creative or share the resources as well. And I know that's true um, for our listeners. I'll give a selfish plug for all of my, uh, my HSO counterparts across the country. Every jurisdiction and territory has a highway safety office. If you do a quick little Google, or you can also visit something called the Governor's Highway Safety Association, GHSA. They are the Association of Highway Safety Offices. You can find the contact information uh, for your HSO in, in that resource. Um, all of the offices are looking to engage college communities, and we all have funding. Um, so there's a, you know, a win-win opportunities to engage your college community in uh, substance use and underage drinking prevention and impaired driving prevention. Uh, and there are wonderful partnerships that they can help facilitate uh, at the state and regional level as well. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned them because that was going to be a, a bonus question that I didn't even have to ask, you know, was for viewers about connecting with their state's highway safety office. And, and I've said plenty on plenty of occasions, whether it's your state, you know, agency that deals with, you know, uh, drug use issues, or like you say, the governor's highway safety office, don't wait to be invited to the table for some of these things. Invite yourself. So find out from your, their mm -hmm. office um, as, you know, they, they have funding. It may not be, you know, blank checks, you know, left and right, but, you know, certainly make that opportunity available to yourself by, by being proactive and reaching out and, and, and see how the state office may be able to collaborate with you. That's right. And not only do they have those funding opportunities, which, as you said, Rich, aren't blank checks, but they are you know, pretty versatile in what we can do. Uh, but they also have those partnership elements, which I think are every bit as valuable to be able to form relationships. Usually if there's a problem you're facing on campus, uh, they have a relationship to solve them. Many of our, our larger states uh, have something called law enforcement liaisons, which can offer additional training to your on-campus police department to work specifically on substance use. Uh, and underage drinking and impaired driving prevention. So there are lots of resources that the HSO can make available uh, if you if you just invite yourself to the table, as you said, Rich. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as we're winding down now on the interview, I, I end with the question I ask of, of all the guests that, that appear on the podcast. And that's, you know, for you to basically, the mic is yours. What advice do you have for our viewers who want to make a difference in preventing impaired driving among college students? I think the most important thing is to speak up and get involved. Uh, and I say that both on a personal and a professional level. Uh, every day we find ourselves professionally in opportunities to integrate this work into what we do. We forget that the most dangerous thing we do every day is move from point A to point B. Whether we're a pedestrian, uh, we're, in an, we're in a vehicle, we're using public transportation. Uh, when we're in mobility, that's when we're most vulnerable. And it's one of the greatest risks to our health and safety. So speak up if you find yourself in a situation where you don't feel safe. Speak up if you see a friend or a colleague about to, to make a poor choice. Uh, and then on a personal level, you know, just reminding ourselves that responsibility is a shared aspect, right? It's a shared verb that we all have to take seriously. We have to you know, hold ourselves to those high standards to make sure that we get where we're going safely and do everything we can to make sure that everyone else 
is doing the same. Well, that's great advice. And as I was, you know, listening throughout the entire interview, as long as I've been in this field, this this particular topic has just morphed into uh, mm -hmm. just a, a bigger issue. When I think about the fact that you know impaired driving, it's not just about cars anymore. Like you said, we've got right. you've got scooters, you've got bicyclists, you also have pedestrians. So you know there are different modes of mobility, as we would say, of, of getting from point A to point B. And then it's not when we're talking impairment, it's not anymore just about alcohol, which used to be the case. Now we're talking, you know, whether it's cannabis or prescription drugs or cocaine. I mean, all of these different drugs affect your body differently. They impair you differently. And right. that's what we've been trying to say with the impairment issue. You know, right. the, the myth out there that people have that, well, I'd rather be, you know, driving if I just smoked a joint instead of drank a beer because actually, you know, I can handle myself better impaired, if you will, you know, using right. marijuana. And that's just a myth we're trying to really bust. Yeah, it's right. And, and you know, we applaud folks who make that choice to not drive and they'll walk or they'll, they'll think they're doing right by choosing another form of transportation. And that, that is the, the right inkling, but there's just another step you have to take. If you're going to be impaired and walking, there are unique challenges to your safety. Then if you're going to be trying to get on a bike or a scooter, we don't recommend that. You know, there are really neat challenges there. So, again, it all goes back to planning ahead. It goes back to making sure you've got a, a squad or a group of people that, you know, can work together to keep you safe and understanding the policies, procedures, the cultures that make our universities unique. That is how we can change uh, the, the conversation and get us to what we think is the only, only ultimate goal, which is zero roadway fatalities, particularly among our college students. Yeah. Well, Rick, I, I thank you so much for being on this episode. Uh, I know we at DEA look forward to collaborating with you now in your new role. Uh, we look forward to uh, highlighting uh, resources that are going to be coming out of your office. And, you know, I said it before, it's been this whole episode. It's a kind of a the professional hat and the personal hat, if you will. You know, I am just excited for you um, leading uh, the Highway Safety Office in the area that I live um, because of the, the experience and the energy and the expertise that you bring to this role. Um, I'm excited for what's to come. Well, thank you, Rich, and thank you for your many years of service to not only D.C., but the broader U.S. and, and helping us stress this issue. I really appreciate your leadership, your partnership, and your friendship. So looking forward to doing great things together. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks again, Rick. And to our viewers, uh, thanks for, for tuning in. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode and all of the previous episodes that you can watch and listen to on campusdrugprevention.gov. So with that, I'll say thanks for watching and have a great day.